Well, praise the Lord, folks. It is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m., and that means it is time for us to begin our midweek Bible study. We welcome you this evening from our home in Decatur, Alabama, just outside of Huntsville. Uh, that's where we're doing our Bible studies for the time being. And uh, we welcome you, of course, in none other than the wonderful saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God said, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. And that's why we say that and say it that way. We have been engaged now for a few weeks uh, in our Bible study series that I've simply titled LGBT Affirming Theology. We're looking at some of the, not some of, all of the passages that are commonly used uh, by right-wing fanatical fundamentalist and evangelical so-called Christians in order to bash and to condemn wholesale LGBT people. And um, we started out looking at what I knew would be uh, everybody's first, you know, uh, thought, and that is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and her sister cities and their destruction in Genesis 19. We followed up after that by looking at the term uh, employed in the King James text, an invention of the King James writers, uh, a term sodomite. And we looked at the actual definition and the true meaning of the word sodomite. Prior to that, as part of our looking at the story of Sodom, we had also looked at the actual stated reasons by God through his prophet for the destruction of Sodom. And um, so we, we started out with a bang. And uh, now we're going to begin to look at the issue of homosexuality as it is uh, addressed in the Old Testament or as we're told, it's addressed in the Old Testament. Let's put it that way. And uh, I think you're going to find this uh, particular study very, very um, instructional and very important. If you're not an LGBT person, you know, a lot of times people want to say, well, I, you know, that doesn't apply to me, so it's not important for me to know this. Oh, yes, it is. There, there is so much good information that's going to come out in this uh, study tonight that is applicable to everybody, you know. Uh, so it's important that if you're able, you get yourself a cup of coffee, come sit with us, and uh, enjoy this look at the Word of God with us. We want to begin our, our time together tonight with a word of prayer as always. Master, we love you, God, tonight, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to break the bread of life and to extract from this heavenly manna the truths of God's Word, the wisdom, O oh God, of the ages, which you have passed down to us through this wonderful sacred, sacred document. Master, tonight in the name of Jesus, we loose the anointing and the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost. We pray, Lord, that as the truth of God goes forth, that it might liberate. The Word of God declares he sent his word and healed them. Many people in our communities today are broken, they're wounded, they're hurting. And we ask God tonight that by reason of your word, you would heal, you would deliver, and most importantly, you would save. Reclaim the backslider, restore those, Lord, who have wandered away from their faith. And help them to find a place once again in the fellowship of God's church. 
Master, in the name of Jesus, touch the speaker. I'm still wrestling with my allergy issues tonight, and I need your touch. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I am going to warn you in advance. I'm really struggling. Um, my allergies, are, they're starting to calm down a little bit over what they had been uh, a week ago or so. Last Wednesday, I was coughing and hacking so bad that I couldn't have spoken. I, I doubt highly I could have spoken. Honestly, Sundays are a miracle. For those of you who don't believe in God and don't believe in the anointing, let me tell you something. The fact that I can get up on Sunday and preach um, and not be so burdened with coughing and hacking is miraculous. And I mean, literally, it is nothing short of miraculous. Tommy can tell you, because starting up to the service, I'm coughing and hacking. And then the service proceeds. I might cough a little, you know. But then as soon as the service is over, I go right back to coughing and hacking. And it's terrible. So, um, you know, the anointing really does make the difference. I'll tell you, God really does. The Word of God said, they that wait upon the Lord, not meaning they that stand in front of God and do nothing. That is not what it means when it says they that wait upon the Lord. It means they that do the Lord's bidding. The same way a waiter waits tables. You know, they wait on tables. They're doing your bidding. They're getting what you need. They're doing for you. The Word of God said, They that wait upon the Lord, they that do the Lord's bidding, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like his eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, obviously, if you're just standing waiting, you don't need any of those things. But if you're doing the Lord's bidding, you need all those things. Amen. So he says, if you're doing my bidding, you're going you're gonna to sprout wings and fly like an eagle. He said, if you're doing my bidding, you're going to walk and not faint. If you're doing my bidding, you're going to be able to run. And, you know. and so that's what that passage literally means. And when a person is called of God to ministry, if they believe the word of God as I do, then I, I tell the Lord all the time, Lord, you promise they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So I get up on Sunday and go to church coughing and hacking and puking and spewing <laughs> and sounding like, you know, something out of a horror movie. And I go because I believe the word of God. He said, you know, and without fail, he comes through every time. And uh, every once in a while, my faith kind of fails me. Last Wednesday night was one of those nights. To be honest with you, I'd been struggling. Um, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, I'd been struggling so bad with my allergies that, uh, quite frankly, I just didn't want to be bothered. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, last Wednesday night, I just didn't want to be bothered because I know... When I, when I get like that, you know, that I, I get miserable. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm one of those kind of people, God help me, whenever I'm feeling on the inside comes out. I, I'm not one of those people who can hide my feelings, you know, deep in me while I'm doing something else. And uh, so in other words, it, I might have had kind of a bad attitude last week. I might have said things in a way I shouldn't have said them, you know, just because I was just going through such a battle. All right, enough of that. Let's move on with our study. Now, we're going to begin today to look at the issue of homosexuality as it is, I like to say, commonly misrepresented in the Old Testament. However, anyone who knows my teaching and knows my teaching style, uh, you understand that I believe in keeping everything in the proper context, keeping everything in the proper order. For that reason, you cannot begin 
to look at this issue or any issue in the Old Testament without having a very, very clear understanding of the purpose and the process uh, and the meaning behind the Old Testament. If you don't understand the where's and the why's and the, you know, who's of the Old Testament, it, you know, many fundamentalist and evangelical Christians, and folks, I was raised this way, literally. I was raised in the Assemblies of God, uh, which is, uh, it, according to the Human Rights Campaign, it is the most homophobic religious organization in America. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot of trouble with that issue per se in the Assemblies of God. But I was raised with that very fundamentalist, very evangelical mindset that God sat down and just started talking and told certain people, write words that I'm saying down. And every single word that the Word of God, is, that's written in the Word of God, God breathed. He spoke and someone pinned it, you know. Uh, they took dictation. That is a falsehood, that is wrong, that is not at all true. Uh, if you've been around my teaching, which of course here in Alabama, most of you folks haven't, so I have to repeat myself a little bit for the benefit of new people. Um, the Word of God comes to us in two primary segments. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, when you read the word scriptures, or even the word of God or scriptures, any term of that nature, it is always, always, always making reference to the Old Testament canon. These writers didn't sit down and endorse their own work. That, honestly, folks, that's what cults do, okay? Cults create the, um, they create the notion that they, that they have divine authority. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, uh, up there in New York, they claim that their high council, you know, those guys, man, they, they get every word they get straight from Jehovah, straight from God, you know. And how do you know that's so? How do you know that? Because they told you. How do you know their organization is the only organization on earth that's right and that's doing God's bidding because they told you so. You see, that's, that's self-endorsement. And that, that is not at all what the apostles were doing. In the New Testament era, the apostles rightly, rightly claimed authority because Jesus had given them the authority. We read records uh, in the Gospels of the Lord giving his apostles authority. And the apostles were in a very unique position. This is why I believe there are a lot of people running around today calling themselves apostles who are not apostles because the word apostle simply means one who is sent. Well, any any preacher that's ever been called to preach then could claim to be an apostle. But the apostles um, had a very specific criteria that they abided by and uh, the, the, the 12, the original 12, walked and lived with Jesus for three and a half years of public ministry. So they were his students for three and a half solid years. They witnessed his death. They witnessed his burial. They witnessed his resurrection. They witnessed his ascension. 
they all were in the upper room and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, of course, Judas betrayed the Lord. And sadly, Judas could not find it in himself to forgive himself and to, to even seek forgiveness from God for his uh, turning on Jesus, and he committed suicide. The apostles voted to replace him with somebody, which was not in divine order. They cast lots to determine who would replace Judas. That was not in divine order, folks. Nowhere do you see that God spoke from heaven and said, this is what you all need to do. No, God already had a replacement online for Judas, but he would come a little while later. That was a man named Saul who was uh, trained as a Pharisee. He was uh, extremely well educated. He knew the Old Testament backward and forward, the Torah, the Talmud. He understood all of these things. And God would later save him he would experience conversion from unbelief to belief on the road to Damascus. In Damascus, he would be met by Ananias who would lay hands on him that he might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and that he might uh, receive his sight back because he lost his sight in the experience on the road to Damascus. And Saul became Paul and Paul had met the criteria of a apostle in that he had literally seen, physically seen the resurrected Christ after the resurrection on the road to Damascus. The word of God said, others saw the light and they heard a voice, but they saw no one. Paul saw Jesus. And that is one of the criteria. You had to be a physical witness to the resurrected Christ. Paul met that criteria. How do we know? Because again, when, when uh, Christians, early Christians in the first century, would question Paul's authority, and many, many questioned his authority as an apostle, Paul had a hard time, folks. I'm going to tell you something. His entire ministry... He was constantly fighting with Christians who did not want to accept him as an apostle. They did not want to submit to his authority as an apostle. But Paul pointed to the fact that he met the criteria for an apostle, including having seen the resurrected Christ. Okay? So... The Old Testament, according to the writing of the New Testament, the Old Testament is given to us by divine inspiration. In many instances, for instance, in the cases of the prophets especially, we know for a fact that God breathed, you know, that God spoke the words, and the prophet wrote the words that God told them to write. And um, uh, we know that uh, Moses is counted amongst the Jewish faith as being the greatest of prophets. He was actually a prophet according to Judaism, and he was the greatest prophet according to Judaism. And uh, we know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, which are known to us today as the Pentateuch, also known by Jews as the Torah, and he wrote the Torah, the first five books. Those books constitute the law. So when you read in the Old or New Testament, you read the word law, it is referring to the first five books of the Old Testament. It is not referring to every word written in Song of Solomon, every word written in the Psalms, every word written in Proverbs, every word written. No, no. The Old Testament is divided into various categories. You have the law, you have minor prophets, you have major prophets, you have the uh, books of wisdom. Okay, uh, the law is the law. 
and it serves a specific function and a specific purpose. Now, I'm going to try to get into this today, and I'll be honest with you, um, I'm going to do a lot of reading, okay? this Every word of this I've written, but I'm going to read primarily so I can get my thoughts out and make it abundantly clear, hopefully, to the listener. There are really relatively few places in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, where homosexuality is even alluded to. Uh, at least, that is, according to more modern English translations dating as far back as the King James. It's important when we research the Word of God that we have some grasp of what the times and circumstances were surrounding the right of the writing of any particular passage. To ignore the customs, the traditions, and the circumstances of the times is to do the message of Scripture a huge disservice. We can easily pull passages out of context and try to make them say whatever we wish, but if the writer was clearly trying to say one specific thing, and we are clearly and purposely making it say something else, then we become guilty of mishandling the Word of God. Okay, many false teachers, preachers, prophets exist today who run around trying to condemn the LGBT community in wholesale fashion. Uh, their condemnation is based upon misrepresentation of God's holy scriptures. And many have exchanged their place in the kingdom and family of God for decadent and godless lifestyles simply because they have been convinced, I'm talking about LGBT people, simply because they've been convinced that they are hopelessly lost anyway. But what they don't understand is their God is not the one who is saying you're hopelessly lost. Dingalings who don't know how to search the scriptures and study the word of God, those people are saying it, and you're buying into it. You're believing it. Before we get too involved in the complicated specifics of the few passages in the Old Testament most often used to condemn LGBT people, uh, I want us to look first very carefully at the nature and purpose of the law. This, this must be, this is something we must look at before you begin to look at passages within the law and within the context of the Old Testament. In Galatians 3, 1 through 3, I'm going to read from the NIV so you can understand it a little more clearly. Paul writes, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he upbraids them for suddenly allowing themselves to be convinced that even though they have believed and obeyed the gospel of Christ, they must now uphold and embrace every letter of the Old Testament Mosaic Law. He asks them, having begun in the Spirit, having begun as a spiritual transformation, which is what the born-again experience is, are you now trying to attain salvation, redemption, through human effort? The law is all about human effort, folks. That's, that's one of the first points you have to understand. 
the law was God saying, okay, let me show you what you would have to do if you wanted to be saved on your own effort. Let me show you what you'd have to do. All these things. Okay? Uh, uh, let me continue. Paul later goes on in Galatians 3 to point out that while the law was established as a school teacher, helping us to recognize our need for the Savior, after the Savior has come, there's no longer need of a school teacher. In other words, the law is no longer binding, not since faith and obedience to the gospel came to humanity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it is by faith and God's grace alone that we are saved and not by stringent adherence to the rules and regulations of the law. Paul said in Galatians 3 again, going down to verses 22 through 25, but the scripture, Old Testament, hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. In other words, when he says shut up, he, he says literally he's saying reserved or kept in reserve. It's like put in a cabinet for later use, you know. So the, the Jews... They were kept under the law, but the whole purpose of the law was to help humanity realize it is impossible to meet God's standard. And if it is impossible to meet God's standard, then the promise of the Messiah should be something that we long for, that we desire more than anything in this world. The problem is by the time Jesus came, you had a whole bunch of people who were more interested now in the rules and regulations than they were in the promised Messiah. They were more interested in the form, the religious form, than they were in the actual Messiah. They hadn't learned the lesson that the law was meant to teach. Rather, they had convinced themselves that they could be perfect, that they could live every letter of the law. Interestingly enough, Christianity has followed the same identical path. And we have Christians today who have convinced themselves the same identical way that, in effect, they can earn heaven by their own effort. You know, the Jehovah's have a whole list of stuff you got to do that you can't do. And if you do it, you're going to get reported to the elders and dragged into the, to the uh, local kingdom hall. And boy, they're going to, you know, shun you and all this kind of fun stuff. The Mormons do the same garbage. And these organizations all have their rules. Mormonism, you can't drink Coca-Cola, you can't have coffee, you can't have tea, you can't have anything with caffeine. Jehovah's, you can't chew tobacco, you can't smoke. It's funny, though, you can drink, but that's beside the point. I grew up Pentecostal. Good God, we didn't even use cough syrup if it had alcohol in it. You know, so you get these people now who believe that holiness is somehow attained and manifested and demonstrated through their own human effort. And just as Paul is writing to the Galatians, these people don't get it. The whole purpose of the Old Testament, they don't get it. The Old Testament is there to teach us one simple lesson. The Old Testament is there to make us hungry 
Oh, I'm preaching. Forget about teaching. I'm preaching. I might even get happy here in a minute. The Old Testament was designed to make us hungry for Messiah. Oh, God, I can't do this. Send Messiah. I need the Messiah. We need a Savior. We need the Christ. We need the Anointed One. That was the whole purpose of the Old Testament. If you understood the law at all, then while you're trying, because you are bound by it, while you're trying to live up to all the rules and regulations, you, of course, if you're honest, which most Christians are not, and which most Jews are not and were not at that time, you recognize you don't have the ability. It is beyond your ability. The truth is, as James points out in James chapter 2, verse 10, if we are to even attempt to be saved by adhering to the Old Testament law, then it is essential, it, it's not optional, it's required that we embrace every single rule and regulation presented in the law. Because to fail in one point of the law is to be guilty of having broken all the law. So for you LGBT people out there who've allowed yourself to become convinced that you can't be a Christian, you can't live for God, you can't serve the Lord, you can't go to church, because after all, somebody pointed to this one sentence or two sentences in the Old Testament law in the first five books. Sweetie, first of all, that law taught us the lesson that we needed to learn. And it is done, it is sealed, it is over. Now, salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That is all you need to worry about. That is all you need to be concerned about. It's not about human effort. That includes in the New Testament, but we're going to get there further on in our study, okay? In James chapter 2, verse 10, the, the uh, Lord's brother, James, was Jesus' physical half-brother. They both shared the, the mother Mary. James writes, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That, that was the nature of the law. That was the nature of what is written in the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now listen, the severity of the law is so unimaginable. Let's look at some of the rules God established for his people. And remember... To break even one of these is to become guilty of having broken all of them. So there's no such thing as big sin, little sin. There's no such thing as greater sin and lesser sin. No, no, no. To break one is the same as having broken all of them. So listen, Deuteronomy 23 and 20. I'm going to read it to you from the NIV, so it'll be perfect. I, you know, I don't want the King James language to, to make it hard for you to understand. Deuteronomy 23, 20, NIV. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a brother Israelite so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land you are entering to possess. Now notice, there's, there's something really important about the law that most Christians just skate over. They, they just, they, they, it's so far from being in their brain, it's not even funny. The law was given to the nation of Israel for the nation of Israel. 
it was specific to Israel. God was teaching humanity this lesson that we cannot possibly live up to God's standard. But he was not teaching humanity this lesson by placing this requirement upon everyone. But he placed it only upon one specific nation, the offspring of Abraham and Sarah. Okay? The law is specific to Israel. Say, well, okay, Pastor, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is you're a harebrained if you try to take these rules and regulations and apply them to yourself. Unless you have converted officially to Judaism, unless you have become uh, a part of the Jewish nation, honey, those, those rules don't apply to you anyway. It's idiotic to think that laws we have in America are applicable to people in Russia or in China or in Japan. Of course they're not. No, each nation has their own rules. Each nation has their own law. And that is the case with the law that God gave to Moses. He gave that law to Moses for the nation of Israel. There were reasons for this. Part of it was so that he could carve out a unique people for himself. And again, the Word of God teaches us that the Old Testament contains types and shadows of things to come. So in other words, a lot of the things we see in the Old Testament are representative of New Testament concepts. God wants people who are unique. They're different from the rest of the world. There are things about them that are so specific to their walking in relationship with God that people in the world wouldn't even do these things by accident. When, when you get into the law and you read how men are to wear little curly cue, long hair down by the sideburns, you know, and married men are to wear beards and all this sort of thing. And uh, this is all to create a highly unique people. It's not very likely there are going to be a whole lot of people in the world who are going to turn around and wear that as a hairstyle just because they think it looks cute. It really doesn't look cute. Honestly, they, they look at the Hasidic Jews of New York City or Hasidic Jews of any great city and you'll see they really, uh, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, but they're not the prettiest people. They're, it's not the prettiest look. It's not about being pretty. It's about being unique. You do things. As a believer, the Word of God, for instance, says, love your enemies. Well, listen, as a child of God, if I love my enemies, I'm doing something that I promise you most unbelievers wouldn't even do that by accident. You follow what I'm saying? But that's part of being a unique child of God, being unique in that you're walking in relationship with God. Okay? So, the Jew, he says, may charge foreigners interest on loans, but they cannot charge a fellow Jew interest. Now, for someone to turn around and say, well, that means as an American, I can't charge a fellow American interest, but I can charge other people interest. You're a moron. That is not what that means. He specifically, specifically, specifically says, and God does not waste words. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a brother Israelite. This is not a general rule that applies to all nations. No, this is the law. This applies 
to Israel. Do you follow me? Are you getting this? You see how important this is to get this? Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, also from the NIV. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Oh, gee, I wonder how the Republicans who seem to believe the law is all applicable to us as Americans and everybody else in the world. Hallelujah, glory to God. They don't even want to give people time off for having children. And here God says when a man marries, he is to be given a year free of all duties. All duties. He don't have to work on the farm. He don't have to do chores. He don't have to collect eggs. He don't have to milk the cow. He don't have to uh, feed the animals. He doesn't have to go to work and do a job, literally, so that for one full year, he and his wife can devote themselves to one another, getting to know one another, exploring one another, enjoying one another, experiencing one another, etc., etc., etc. That was the law, folks. Leviticus 19, verse 14. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. So the Lord is saying, you don't play tricks on blind people. You don't, uh, or, you know, if a blind person somehow or another offends you, you don't put your foot out to, to make them stumble just because you think it's funny, you know, or to get revenge. You don't curse a person who cannot hear you. Cursing them. Says you don't do that. Okay, this is the law. Leviticus 19.17 Do not hate your brother in your heart. Wow. Talk about specific. This is the law, folks. To break one of these, you've broken all of them. Do not hate your brother in your heart. So look how, look how constrictive that is, you know. Boy, God isn't giving you a lot of wiggle room. It's like, Lord, you know, uh, can I hate him in the heart as long as I don't mistreat him? No. No. So what is God telling the Jewish people? He's saying, you all are going to have to learn how to work, work, work on loving one another. We got husbands and wives in the world today that don't understand that loving your spouse is a commandment of God's word. Even in the New Testament, the apostles wrote, husbands, love your wives. Well, we just fell out of love. We got a divorce because we just fell out of love. Really? That's funny. Because according to the word of God, there's no such thing as falling out of love. According to the word of God, listen to me now, folks. Some of y'all getting mad at me already. But according to the word of God, it takes work to love somebody. There are times when your love is going to take effort on your part. I tell young couples wanting to get married all the time, listen, don't think for one minute that love's going to carry you from wedding day to the grave. It ain't going to happen. Love ain't going to do it. There's going to be days you look at him and you say, you dirty, rotten scoundrel. I don't know why in the world I married you. You're about the ugliest, dopiest weenie I ever saw in my life. And bubba -da -bubba -da -bubba -da -bubba. And some of y'all are laughing and say, oh, I can never feel that way about my husband or my wife. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, get married. Let's see how it happens. But you know what does carry you? Commitment. When you stand before the preacher and you make your vows, if, you know, the Word of God said don't make a vow. 
<laughs> don't vow a vow because God holds you to those folks. All these people have been married three, four, five, eight times, and each time they make a vow, and they keep breaking the vow they make. One day they're going to answer to God. In the, I'm not saying they're going to split hell wide open. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying they are going to answer for that. People think in the judgment that everything is heaven or hell. No, it isn't heaven or hell. But you will answer. There's going to be some humiliation. There's going to be some embarrassment for a lot of people when they stand before God in the judgment. And all of a sudden the Lord says, oh, by the way, you know, while you were sitting in judgment of these people and these people and these people, and while you were criticizing and condemning these people and those people and those people, um, look what you did here. And here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Oh, and by the way, I am bound to judge you by the same standard that you judged others. So I hope you got a good explanation because you weren't very inclined to accept anyone's explanation for anything. Do you follow what I'm telling you folks? No, there are times when loving your children, you know, parents in today's world, uh, uh, people who literally just turn out their LGBT children, that is contrary to the teaching of God's word. That is contrary to the teaching of the apostles who said, love your children. He didn't say, love them when they're likable, love them when they're lovable, love them when they're squishy and wishy. No, he said, love your children. He didn't say, husband, love your wives as long as they're acting right. Love your wives as long as things are good. Love your wives as long as she's squishy and mushy. No, he said, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. It takes effort. It takes work sometimes. There are times when it gets so bad, it takes divine intervention. And we need to go to the Lord and ask Him, God, help me. Help me to find the love for my spouse that I once had. Help me to find the love for my child that I once had. God never, never, ever has called anyone to hate their spouse or to hate their children because of any issue in their life. And if you think that is scriptural, you, there's something wrong with you. And you have perverted the word of God to a degree that is unimaginable. The word of God said we're not to love father or mother, husband or wife, son or daughter, more than the Lord. But you can love the Lord the most and still love your children and love your spouse as the word of God commands us to love them. In Leviticus 19.17, the Lord also said rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. What this literally means is, if you do not voice that someone has wronged you, if you do not put voice to the fact that they have done you wrong or done you dirty, if you don't rebuke them for that conduct or that behavior, the Lord said, well, then you, you share in their guilt. In other words, you made no effort whatsoever to even give them an opportunity to repent. You never gave them an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. In the New Testament, this same teaching is carried over when the Word of God tells us if your brother or sister sin against you, go to them. Go to them. You don't, you don't hold a grudge against somebody if they've done you wrong or done you dirty, it is your obligation to go to them because by giving them an opportunity to apologize, giving them an opportunity to repent, giving them an opportunity to express remorse, you're literally taking care of business before judgment day 
The Bible said, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is a legal phrase. This is a legal term. This has nothing to do with running around binding devils and binding this and binding that. And blah, blah, blah. That's not what that means, folks. This is legal terminology, just like when we say, uh, I had a binding contract, meaning it was signed, it was sealed, everything required legally to make that contract absolutely valid and enforceable uh, exists. Therefore, it is a binding contract, or we had a binding agreement, okay? So when you say whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, if you forgive someone on earth, if you go to someone and say, you know, you really hurt my feelings, or you did me dirty, whatever the case might be, and that person turns around and says, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Well, what is our obligation as a Christian? We must forgive. We don't have any choice but to forgive. And this is why, again, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is not a wholesale, Lord, I'm forgiving everybody, so forgive me. That is not what he's saying. But he is saying, what you're saying when you pray that is, Lord, in the same way that I forgive those who, who've done me wrong, please forgive me as well, in that same fashion. You follow? So, it's important to rebuke someone that's done you wrong, that's done you. Just speak up, speak your mind, say what you need to say, because that gives them an opportunity. Now somebody says, but pastor, what if they don't repent? What if they try to deny it? What if they try to act like it never happened? Blah, 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 blah. Then they are going to answer for that in the judgment before God because that matter has not been sealed. That matter has not been bound. When, you, when someone uh, confesses and acknowledges wrongdoing and you forgive it, that forgiveness becomes a binding contract and it's bound in heaven. In other words, they stand before God, the Lord's not even gonna mention that matter. It's been taken care of. You took care of it on earth. But if it's an unsettled matter, or if it is a matter in which the other individual refused to take responsibility, or refused to acknowledge, or repent, they are going to answer to God for that matter. Do you follow? Okay? Told you there was a lot of good teaching in here. For some of you straight folks who are part of our church, there's a lot of good stuff here, folks. Leviticus 1919, the year my grandpa was born. Uh, Keep my decrees, the Lord said. Do not mate different kinds of animals. All these muck dogs we have run around, all these purebred dogs we have run around are in contradiction to God's law. You were not supposed to mix breeds. You were not supposed to make different kind of animals. No, nope. not supposed to do that. That's human beings trying to create something that God didn't create. Think about it. You got all these Christians running around talking about, you know, cloning and, you know. That is human beings trying to create some, trying to create a horse that can do certain types of work better, or trying to create a dog that can hunt better, that has better instincts because you're taking the attributes from this one and mixing it with this one. And breeders <coughs> over the centuries have mixed breeds in order to create a new breed. God says you don't do that. Do not plant your field, listen to this, with two kinds of seed. All you folks with your backyard gardens and you've got your corn here and your peas here, tomatoes there, your squash there, your cucumbers there, your zucchini here and your eggplant there. And I, the preacher's guilty of this too. 
Can't do that. No, nope, no. Nope. You have a plot for this and you have a separate plot for the other. You do not mix seed in your fields. You do not allow different types of plants to grow with and amongst one another. See what I mean about how tight the law was, how restricted? And really a lot of this I believe God did strictly for, again, it was about creating a unique people. How, how many other nations are going to do things this way, right? But also, uh, I believe the Lord did it partly just to demonstrate you can't possibly keep all my rules. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Oh Lord, half the modern world's going to hell because they wear poly cotton blends. You can't do that. I'm talking about folks, to break one point of the law is to have broken all of them. And listen to what some of these, listen to how intricate and how, how uh, strict some of these laws were. And if you're if you're a Torah keeping Jew and somebody walks up to you who claims to keep Torah and they're wearing a mixed fabric outfit, an outfit of fabric made out of different materials, let me tell you something, honey. They're looking at you like you're the biggest whore on the planet. Why? simply because you broke Torah. No matter what you want to claim, the fact is you broke Torah. Doesn't matter how you did. If they see you out at Red Lobster having shrimp, you've broken Torah. Period. End of the story. And doesn't matter how you break it, Christians try to separate the law into different categories. And I've spoken with and studied the Jewish faith and Jewish uh, rabbis and everything, and they laugh because they're like idiots, absolute idiots, trying to say there's ceremonial law and there's uh, religious law and there, there's uh, moral law and holiness law, and you know, they try to separate the law, and the Jews laugh because, no, no there isn't. There's one law, period. It is binding. All of these rules apply. There are no exceptions. None fall into a, quote, lesser category. That is the invention of Christian minds. Leviticus 19.27, do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. So you wonder why these Hasidic Jews run around and their beards are all uneven and all, you know, rough looking and they don't trim their beards. They don't cut their beards at all. You can't trim it. You can't shape it. You can't make it look that. Nope, how it grows is how you have to wear it. That's a pretty strict law, isn't it? Can't shave or cut your sideburns. Nope. They got to let them grow. However long they grow, just got to let them grow. Deuteronomy 23, 1 and 2. No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born of a forbidden marriage nor any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the 10th generation. So if you married outside of your faith, that is a forbidden marriage in Judaism, and you were not allowed to participate in any of the temple activities. You were still expected to keep Torah, but you were not allowed to participate in the communal activities within the temple or within the synagogue. Leviticus 20, 9 and 10, listen to this now. If anyone curses his father or mother, this is for those who want to run around telling us that 
The Bible says homosexuals should be put to death. Uh -huh. If anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, and his blood will be on his own head. Verse 10, Leviticus 20. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Yeah, kill the queers, idiots. But worship Donald Trump who's married to one woman, has an affair with another, divorces the one to marry the other, then has an affair on her, divorces her to marry another, marries the other, and then goes out and has affairs on her, which are all well documented. According to the word of God, he should have been stone dead after the first time around. Do you see how constricted the law was? I'm only pointing to these examples as a means of helping uh, us to realize how important the law was to keep. But that was the point. God wanted his people to see, by reason of the law, that they couldn't possibly be good or holy enough in and of themselves. Unfortunately, mainly within the Jewish faith, uh, it, they took it upon themselves to actually try to live up to every single ordinance and commandment. And when Jesus came, they criticized him for not doing so to their interpretation of these laws. Because the Bible tells us he didn't break the law, that Jesus didn't break Torah. And yet, at the same time, there were things he and his disciples did that clearly were in contradiction with how the, uh, the uh, scribes and Pharisees of his day interpreted Torah. They peeled off corn on the Sabbath so they could eat. And the scribes and Pharisees said, hey, they're working on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And the Lord said, really? He said, if your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, you're not going to pull it up out of the ditch? Going to let it lay in there and die? No, there are some things that are necessity. And if necessity dictates it must be done, by all means do it. But the prohibition against doing anything on the Sabbath had to do with making plans and, and choosing to do things. So in other words, you would plan to do nothing on the Sabbath. But by the same token, if a necessity arose that demanded you must do it, by all means, Jesus said, by all means, do it. You know, you need to eat, peel and you'll pick. Pick an apple, pick a pear. But these morons in his day were telling them that that was sinful, that they shouldn't be doing that. Now, how stupid is that? So you, because you can't, according to them, you can't pick an apple off the tree, or you can't pick an ear of corn, that uh, uh, you're supposed to fast all because you didn't happen to have food on you that was already prepared and ready. The biggest problem facing the church today is a legalistic approach to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is no different today, folks, than it was in the Lord's day. Many are trying to be righteous by reason of their actions and deeds in accordance with the law of Moses. But the truth is, we cannot rely upon any form of righteousness which is of our own making. And we must lean and learn to lean. That's why I love that song we sing, learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus. We must learn to lean wholly and entirely on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. By embracing and obeying his gospel, 
We wrap ourselves in his righteousness so that God looks upon us, not as we are today, sinful and imperfect creatures, but rather as the perfected and glorified creatures we shall be once the Lord has redeemed his people and taken us out of this whole world. Hallelujah. Paul wrote Romans 3, 10 through 12, as well as verses 19 through 23. Again today, I use the NIV. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now we know that whatever the law says, Listen to what Paul says. It says to those who are under the law. Who's under the law? The Israelites, the Jews. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. There's that idea of the law is there to teach us that we can't do it. That's what Paul's saying in a nutshell. Verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight, in God's sight, by observing the law. Rather, through the law we became conscious of sin. We know what sin is because of the law. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So the law and the prophets were foretelling this righteousness that would come, which would be apart from the law. He was telling one day we're going to be free from this law. One day we won't be bound by all this because Messiah will have come and he will set us free from the restrictions of this law. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. LGBT person, listen to me. To all who believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So see, when you understand the purpose and the nature of the law, and you understand the law was given to Moses for the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. When you understand these things in proper context, all of a sudden, as we look at some of these Old Testament passages, we have a whole different understanding, don't we? Right off the starting line. We're looking at them very, very differently. Right off the starting line, before we even get into it. We already have a better understanding. So as we look at some of these passages, we're looking at it correctly. Romans 8, 22 through 24, NIV. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? Who hopes for righteousness if you're already righteous? 
We got a bunch of idiots turn around calling themselves holiness. I'm holy before God, hallelujah, because I wear my hair a certain way. I'm righteous for God because I don't do this, I don't do that, I do do this. I do do the, oh, hallelujah, I'm, I'm, I'm just as holy before the Lord, and you're an idiot. All our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags. There are none that are righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. John the Apostle said, if we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. So the truth is, listen carefully. Remember what I said about the Old Testament being types and shadows. I might talk in tongues for a while here in a minute because I'm feeling it getting happy already. Remember I said types and shadows, the Old Testament types and shadows. The Jews longed and yearned for the day that Messiah would come because they were under the cons. Ooh, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> oh, God have mercy. <sighs> they should have been longing, hungry for the day Messiah would come so they would no longer be under the constricts of the law. Guess what? As New Testament believers, we believe and obey the gospel and we secure our salvation through faith. But we're still bound by sinful flesh. We're still bound by this world. We're still subject to the mandates of the flesh. Oh, but we ought to be longing. Hallelujah. Oh, <laughs> glory. We ought to be longing. We ought to be hungry. We ought to be yearning. Glory to God for the day when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. And he sets us free. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. That's the type and the shadow from the Old Testament. They yearn for Messiah to come the first time. We yearn for Messiah to come the second time. Hallelujah! And both of us yearn for the same reasons. Because we're bound. We are subject to. We are under the auspices and authority of certain mandates and certain laws. I don't care how saved you are, you still need to eat. I don't care how saved you are, you still need water. I don't care how saved you are. You still need companionship. Oh, my goodness. Well, if I'm the only one to say it, I'll say it. My God, this is good tonight. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. First Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57. The Apostle Paul writes, I declare to you, brothers that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit that, uh, excuse me, inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. So see, sin affects us in that we die physically. We have to die as human beings. That's how death, excuse me, sin affects us. That's how sin stings us. And the power of sin, what gives the sin power, what gives sin power is the law. Because the law, <laughs> once you know what to do and what not to do, now it is enforceable. If it was never stated, if it was never given, if it was never spoken, <laughs> then it, the, you can't hold somebody to something that's never been established. But the law was established and therefore it gave sin the power because Nobody can live up to God's standard. Therefore, we must die. We can't live forever. We can't possibly live by God's standard. So we understand, I hope, a little bit better the purpose of the law and what the law was all about. We understand that it was given specifically to the nation of Israel was given to Israel for a number of reasons. One of the primary being simply to teach humanity through Israel that you cannot possibly live up to God's standard. It is utterly impossible. But again, I want to talk about that type and shadow a little bit again. Why did God establish this covenant with Abraham, And why did God establish his law through Israel? One tenancy little tiny speck on the planet. Nation of Israel is one of the smallest nations in the world. And yet that one little tenancy nation, God put them under such a powerful uh, constraint in order to carve himself out a unique people, in order to uh, extract the most important possible lesson for all of humanity, why did God do this with just this one Tanitzi little nation? Why didn't he somehow, some way, make this law applicable to all nations, to everybody, everywhere? You know why? Why is it, you know, he didn't raise up a prophet who was preaching this across the board to everybody? I'll tell you why. Because again, types and shadows demonstrating something to us. God was demonstrating to us as believers that his requirements and his requests are only applicable to those who are walking in relationship and in covenant with him. So for us to try to impose our beliefs and our convictions and what we believe on the unbelieving world is an exercise in idiocy. It is the apex of stupidity. Because God says, no, 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 no. The only people that I deal with at all when it comes to right and wrong and doing good and expecting anything out of them at all are my people. That's it. That's it. The rest of them can do whatever they're going to do. They can do whatever they want to do. Now, are they going to wind up being saved in the end? No, they're not going to be saved. But the only people that God has any expectation of are those he's walking in covenant with, those he's walking in relationship with. Believers, stop trying to put your beliefs on other people. Stop trying to make other people. This is why I don't support uh, politicians and parties that try 
to put restrictions on abortion and all this. It has nothing to do with my feelings or my thoughts about abortion, my personal feelings, my convictions, my beliefs, none of that. Doesn't have nothing in the world doing nothing. No, no. If you're a believer, then you need to live whatever you believe concerning abortion. But trying to put that conviction and put that uh, as a law upon others is idiocy. That is not how God operates. That is what he demonstrated in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul said, you have faith? He said, have faith unto yourself. Keep it to yourself. It's between you and God. Let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. You can try every kind of way you want to to try to use the scripture, to perverse the scriptures, to make it say that you're supposed to go out and prevent this and do that and blah, 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 and legislate righteousness and all that horseradish. But folks, you're full of baloney. That is not the word of God. God's expectations, any requirements he has upon his people at all, are applicable only to his people because we are carved out like Israel. We are unique like Israel. We strive like Israel to be godly and holy, not, not living up to the letter of the law, that's not it, but because we want to be like our daddy. Most kids run around and they want to walk in their daddy's footsteps. <coughs> Our Father came from heaven and walked planet earth so that he could demonstrate for us what a life of excellence looks like. If I can use the terminology I use Sunday. What a life of excellence looked like. And it's our obligation to try to be like Daddy. Amen. We want to look like our Father. And I tell people all the time, you don't have to work so hard at it. It's not about, again, it's not about human effort. It's not about you're doing things that make you more like Jesus. No, no, no. The more you walk in relationship with the Lord, the closer you grow to God, the more you learn about Him. Folks, I'm going to tell you some Stuff changes in your life. You'll find things changing that you never dreamed would ever change. And it's simply because the closer you draw to him, the more you begin to reflect him, the more you begin to resemble him, the more you look like him and act like him and walk like him and talk like him. And that's why God gave us the church. That's why God gave us teachers and preachers and pastors. The word of God says so that he could help to mold us and make us better and make us, you know, it, that's the whole purpose of ministry. It's the, the preachers that get up and tell you, you know, human effort, human effort, human effort, human effort. You got to do this. You got to do that. Honey, they're approaching it all wrong. They're approaching it all wrong. And in our church, I know I've told people, <coughs> I've been doing this 30 years. <laughs> It's about, my job is to help you excuse me. Man, my nose is really getting stuck. My job is to help you walk in relationship with Jesus Christ. It is to help you know more about his word, know more about him, draw closer to him. Give him an opportunity to reveal himself to you more and more. Do you know that's one of the primary purposes of church for services? That's why it disgusts the fire out of me that we can't get people to come out to church because God reveals himself to us through corporate worship, through the gifts of the Spirit, through uh, the move of the Spirit in a church service. When you're part of a good Holy Ghost church like I'm hoping to one day see here in Huntsville, 
Honey, every Sunday you go home, every Sunday you go home, and you're going to be saying, boy, God is even more real to me than he was last Sunday. The Lord's even more real to me than he was last Sunday. Because that's what he does. Where two or more gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's about revelation. It is about the Lord revealing himself to us. He reveals himself through his spirit. He reveals himself through worship. He reveals himself through the move of God. He reveals himself through the gifts of the spirit. And all of those things. That's why the church, corporate worship, going to the house of God, coming together as the people of God. That is why that is such an important exercise. And for those of you foolish people who want to say, well, bless God, I can serve God, but I don't have, I can be a Christian, I don't have to go to church. Wrong. Wrong is rain. No, you're going to lose in the end. You cannot win. You cannot win this race on your own. And the primary reason for that is God didn't design this thing for you to win on your own. He designed it so that we're like links in a chain and that the weak support the strong and we help to compensate for one another. We encourage one another to good works. We, at times, we... I'm going to use this term lightly. We rebuke one another uh, when we're going to do something. I, I remember, I'm going to give you an example real quick, and then I'm done because we're almost at 830. Years and years ago, I had made a, a deal with a guy that rented me a house. It was a dump. I mean, literally, this house was a big sty. It was in horrible shape. But I liked the, the the bones of it were good. And I used to, before my health kind of got a little wacky on me, I used to love to do, you know, carpentry and light electrical and remodeling and stuff like that. So anyway, I made a deal with this guy. I said, uh, I will do the physical work of remodeling this house in exchange for rent. I'm not going to be paying no rent because this, this don't, don't deserve anybody to be paying rent. I said, I will make improvements to your property. Your value is going to go up. I said, and all I ask is that you pay half the materials. I will pay the other half. So I'm in effect paying rent. You know, but I'm putting it into your house, okay? I said, and he agreed. This guy agreed. Well, I lived in that house for, oh heavens, my brother and I lived in that house for maybe a year. And man, I did work. Holy mackerel, did I do work on that house. Holy mackerel. My Lord have mercy. I did so much work on that place. I took out walls, I put, you know, I put in new ceilings, I, I redid the fireplace, I put uh, paneling up, and I put wallpaper up, and I painted, and I did all this kind of stuff. And when this guy came and looked at his house, he said, oh my goodness, he said, I can't believe this same house. He said, this place looks amazing, holy mackerel. Now, he's going to be able to rent it now for probably two or three times what he was trying to ask when he met me, okay? He's going to make a whole lot more money on this place now than he ever did before. Long story short, when I went to move, I found out that this character had done me dirty. I was just a young man. I was like 20, 21 at the time. He had done me dirty. I had, uh, he set up an account with the local, uh, uh, you know, box store there. It wasn't like a home, it was similar to Home Depot, but it was like a local hardware and lumber store, you know. And so I would go and I'd get the material, they'd put it on account, you know, I'd pay my share. And long story short, he never paid his share. And then he tried to put that on me. Well, I got mad as a hornet. Oh, I was mad as a hornet. And I hate to admit this. I I'm, I'm, I told you, you know, I try to be honest and, and uh, you know, truthful and transparent. I don't claim perfection. 
And I was I was preaching back then and everything, but I got mad as a hornet. And I said, well, you dastardly son of a gun, you're going to do this to me and try to make me legally responsible for that other half, you know, that he agreed to pay. I, and, I, and the day that I was moving, I started tearing some of that, that uh, paneling off the wall that I put up. I said, I'll let you put it back up. Bless God, but I'm going to take this paneling right off the wall. I was mad as a hornet. Well, my the pastor that I was under at the time was kind of helping us do something concerning the move. I can't remember exactly what, because he wasn't helping us move, but he was there. And and Brother Davis said to me, Chuck, you don't want to do that. You know, you don't you know you, the Lord don't want you to do that, you know. And he calmed me down and he made me think and I stopped acting the fool. That is part of the function of the church. There are times we come to the house of God and we're complaining about something or we're talking about getting revenge or we're talking about getting back at somebody or we're talking about whatever. And another believer, if they're doing their job, if they're doing what God's called them to do, they're going to encourage us. If that person did you dirty, well, honey, you need to go talk to them. Remember what I was saying a little while ago? You know, sweetie, you need to go talk to them. Give them an opportunity to, to repent. And if they don't, well, then it's between them and God. They'll face the Lord in the judgment. But instead of you're sitting here uh, fuming about it, you know, you need to go to them and talk to them. Or they might say, sweetie, the word of God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You know, we're not to be vengeful people. The Word of God tells us not to let the, the root of bitterness spring up within us, you know. And so, in other words, the point is, when we're part of a church, when we're part of the body, then we're encouraging one another to do right and to do good. And our, our fellow believers help us to be better. And when I talk Sunday about pursuing excellence, you know, they help us to rise up a little bit higher, you know, to act better, to do better. They, A lot of times, again, if they're doing their job right, they're not going to be sitting there stoking the fire, making you angry or making you more upset. No, they're going to be trying to talk you down. You know, they're going to be trying to help you find calm and find peace. And, you know, and that is what the church is all about. And that's why we need the church. Anyway, I threw that in as a freebie this evening, okay? Next week, we will continue with our study. Now that we have... Um, kind of gotten some good foundation concerning the law and um, what have you. Next week we're go we've got some passages and we're going to be looking at them in the Old Testament. And I hope you'll come be with us next week for that. But let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you for the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presence of God that we have felt in this place today. Oh, Lord, I'll tell you, studying your word is, is beyond exciting. It's thrilling. It's wonderful. Truth is exhilarating. It's exciting. And I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that I felt in this gathering today. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost touching me, encouraging me, inspiring me as we talk about the wonderful, wonderful truths of your word. I pray, God, for every person listening, participating online with this Bible study. Lord, let what they have heard penetrate not only their mind, but, Lord, let it find its way to the deepest crevice of their heart. And, Master, melt hearts today that are hardened Help, Lord, to restore those who are angry, those who have been hurt, those who have been bruised and wounded, and help them, Master, in the name of Jesus, 
to understand today, Lord, that we're not under the law, we're under grace. Lord, they may have misunderstood things because somebody presented it to them wrong. They may have been living and walking under the notion that they're condemned by God because of who they are. And Lord, today we know that is not fact and that is not true. We know the gospel is open to all. There is no difference, the Apostle Paul said. And all who believe and obey this gospel will share in the same promise. Master, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we need revival so much today. In our world, we need it in the church. America is about to go down burning. And the only hope we have is a revived church because the revived church will get back on its proper mission and will get out of activities and divisive mindsets and do what we have been called to do, which is the spiritual work, calling men and women, boys and girls, unto repentance and faith in God. Oh, Jesus, I love you, Lord, today. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this Bible study. Go with every person. Let the peace of God that passeth all understanding descend right now in the name of Jesus upon every home, every dorm room, every hotel room, every place where someone is sitting and watching this Bible study tonight. Let the peace of God in the name of Jesus right now, God, let the peace of God descend upon that place. Fill with the Holy Ghost, Master, in the name of Jesus. Fill with the power of God in the name of the Lord right now in Jesus' name. Oh, God, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Praise God and amen. Well, I don't know about y'all. I sure was getting fired up today. And, and y'all know I don't necessarily get fired up like that every week. So uh, that was just a blessing from the Lord. I hope that you'll be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. I believe we got a wonderful ministry here in Huntsville, folks. And I really believe that you're missing it if you're screwing around and wasting time about getting out and becoming part of it. Uh, you're just losing out because God is moving. There is something wonderful. We can have an impact on this nation, folks. The church in America, evangelicals and, and uh, uh, fundamentalists have gone off their rocker because of false teaching and false preaching. If God can set a church on fire that's telling the truth here in Huntsville, Alabama, let me tell you something. It only takes a spark to burn down an entire forest. Amen. Only takes a spark to get a fire going. If we can be that spark, and if we can set the Church of Jesus, Whoo, we can set the church back on the right track, get it out of politics, get it out of culture war, get it back to loving people, get it back to preaching Jesus and Him crucified, and you will see such a marvelous change in this nation. You'll see the angst being driven away. You'll see the anger, the division. All of these things are antichrist. All of these things are antichrist. God does not, he is not the author of confusion. He is not the author of division. He is not the author of anger and angst. All of these things will be driven into the darkness if we can just get one stinking church in this country 
that is really willing to love the Lord and serve Him with fervor and passion and make every attempt to teach it and preach it right. That's all we need, and we can change the world. So I hope you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. Next Wednesday, join us again as we continue this study at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. If you have any good positive comments, we really, really, really appreciate it if you leave them for us on Facebook or on our YouTube. Uh, people see those and that encourages them, you know, to watch and listen uh, and share, if you would, our videos. Let other people that you know who could benefit from them, let them see them as well. And uh, we need to get this message out, as many people as we can get to hear it, okay? All right, until next time, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.